So, you want to be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. You get to live in 10 Downing Street, meet the King, enact laws according to your will, and pet Larry the Cat. But how do you get to be chosen? Well, you just run for office, right? Next time an election comes around, you just put your name forward? Well, no. Unlike the US President, the Prime Minister isn't directly elected. You see, the UK is officially a constitutional monarchy, so officially, the monarch chooses the Prime Minister. But really, it's more complicated than that. Although the monarch could just choose a random person off the street, they don't want to do that. Partly because it would make them a lot of powerful enemies with all the people who thought they were going to be chosen, and partly because that person has got to be able to work with all the people they need to run a country with. So as it stands, at the moment, the monarch always picks someone who can command the confidence of the House of Commons. In other words, get bills passed. So how does the monarch choose? Well, we don't have a written constitution, so instead we rely heavily on conventions of etiquette, long-standing rules on how the government should work. For example, no one ever created the office of Prime Minister. Like, There's no law anywhere saying that we must always have one. It's just that gradually, one of the King's ministers got so important that they were called the Prime Minister. So over the years, we've tacked lots of layers of democracy and party machinations onto a system that is still, at its core, a monarchy. Those layers have changed over the years, but as it stands at the moment, the monarch always chooses the leader of the political party who has the most seats in the House of Commons. So how do you get to be that? Well, first you'll want to look at becoming a Member of Parliament, an MP. An MP is a local representative for an area of the country called a constituency. There are 650 constituencies called things like Batley and Spen, Upper Ban and Tooting, so there are 650 MPs. They sit in the lower of the two Houses of Parliament called the House of Commons. There is an upper house called the House of Lords, but the last PM to be chosen from the House of Lords was in 1963, and he renounced his peerage before he took office. The last PM to actually run things from the House of Lords was before the sinking of the Titanic. Uh, this hasn't always been the case, and in the 19th century it was actually much more common to have PMs from the House of Lords than the House of Commons, but it's the reality of the 20th and, so far, 21st centuries. So, to run for being an MP, you have to be a British citizen, or a citizen of the Republic of Ireland, or a citizen of one of the 54 countries of the Commonwealth and who has indefinite leave to remain in the UK, over 18, not disqualified by bankruptcy restrictions, not sentenced to more than one year's imprisonment, not in the House of Lords, and not holding a job that disbars you. There are several jobs that are seen as being in conflict with being an MP, so you can't do them both at the same time. This includes being a civil servant, a judge, being in the army, or being in the police force. So if you have any of those jobs, you have to resign first. Now, technically, you could win an election at this level by standing as an independent candidate apart from any political party, but you've got your eyes on the top job, and for that, you'll need to be a candidate for a political party. Although there are any number of smaller parties you can choose from, none of them have ever sent anyone to the top job. So realistically, you need to be the chosen candidate for your area from one of the two major parties, Labour and the Conservatives, also known as the Tories. So how do you get to be chosen by a party? Well, the party gets to make up its own rules for this, uh, but generally you won't be decided upon by a national body, but by the division of the party for your constituency, for your local area. Um, if you want to be chosen by the Tories, you must be a tax resident and have the right to work in the UK. You must have been a member of the party for three months. You must agree to the Nolan Principles of Public Life, established in 1995 for all public officials, selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership, and not be a member of a rival party. Um, you apply online and if you fit all the criteria, you have to attend a webinar of all things, which lays out the next steps. You pay £110 for them to do what's called a due diligence check on you, which is where they presumably check if you're on the sex offenders register and whether there's any photos of you peeing against a war memorial. And you pay £250 for an appointment at your local assessment centre. Here you do a series of exercises designed to test your judgement, breadth of experience, political convictions and integrity. 
Then you get put on the list of approved candidates and you can apply to vacancies in specific areas. Once you've chosen your area, that local party puts together a shortlist of at least six candidates and then party members vote using an alternative vote system. If you want to be chosen by the Labour Party, you must have been a member of the party for a year and the rest of their rules are hidden behind a paywall on their website. But presumably it won't be too different to how the Tories work. When you run for MP, you have to pay a £500 deposit, which you lose if you get less than 5% of the vote. But since you're the candidate for a major party, they'll pay that for you, as well as most of your election expenses. So now you're a member of Parliament. Uh, You get to vote on making new laws in the UK, and you get to make this noise during the debates. Next, you need to be chosen as the leader of your party. So bad luck if you chose to run as an independent. So how do parties choose their leader? Well, again, there are no laws on this. A party can choose a leader however it likes. So it will differ from party to party and from year to year. One thing that'll improve your chances is if you've held a cabinet or shadow cabinet position, like Chancellor of the Exchequer or Home Secretary. Uh, These are appointed by the leader of the party, so the person whose job you want to take. If you don't do any of these extra jobs and are what they call a mere backbencher, you might still get nominated to the leadership as a joke, but if you want to boost your chances, you'll vie for a cabinet position. If you're in the Labour Party, to be chosen as their leader, you have to be nominated by 10% of MPs and from 5% of constituency parties or at least three affiliates, which make up 5% of affiliated membership, two of which must be trade unions. As you might expect from the name, the Labour Party is closely associated with trade unions and other Labour organisations, and they get to vote on their policies and nominate leaders. Everyone who's got that many nominations goes into a ballot for party members and supporters. They all vote and rank their candidates in order of preference. The winner is chosen using an alternative vote system. The first person to get to over 50% of the vote is the winner. If you are in the Conservative Party, they don't have a set of rules that's the same each time. Instead, every single time they need a new leader, they have to announce fresh how it's going to work. For example, the process for appointing Liz Truss as party leader was very different to how Rishi Sunak got appointed. But you have to be a sitting MP, so no more lords getting the leadership. And like the Labour Party, they'll put together a list of people who've been nominated. They do not explain how MPs get nominated to the leadership. Usually, they'll do ballots to whittle that list down to two candidates. Once it's down to two, the ballot goes out to wider party members. Because there's only two candidates, they don't have to worry about what voting system they're going to use. It's just whoever gets the most votes. So now you're the leader of your party. You get to sit on the front row in Parliament. But how does the king decide which leader to invite to become prime minister? Well, it's whichever one has a majority of seats not votes, in the House of Commons. So when the next general election rolls around, every constituency votes for their MP again, and not only do you have to keep your own seat, but also more of your party members have to win theirs than any other party. Since there are 650 seats, you're ideally hoping to get half that number plus one, which is 326. If 325 of your party members plus yourself win your elections from your constituency, then the previous PM will go to the King and recommend that you get invited to Buckingham Palace to be made the next Prime Minister. If you get more than any other party but still not quite 326, then you'll have to club together with a smaller party or two to make a coalition government where you promise to share power. If you can promise them enough power to keep them happy, then they'll add their numbers to yours to make up the 326 needed and the previous PM will go to the King and recommend that you get invited to Buckingham Palace to be made the next Prime Minister. So that's the journey. Join a major party, become a candidate, become an MP, become party leader, and win a general election. Just five simple steps to becoming Prime Minister of the United Kingdom.